Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to our speaker series program of the National Capital Area Chapter of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, so let me first say something about DBSA. It's an organization that provides peer support, education, and advocacy uh, uh, for individuals impacted by depression, bipolar disorder. Thank you for joining us tonight for this special program. And we didn't realize it when we planned it, but in fact, today is World Bipolar Day. It is March the 30th, the birthday of Vincent Van Gogh, and has been denoted World Bipolar Day. Also note this program is being recorded. If you don't want to be seen on the Zoom screen, you can turn off your camera. You can rename yourself. You should be able to click a thing by, by your name and one of the options should be rename. If you need assistance with this, send a message to the host in the chat box. We've muted all participants at this point. We invite you to submit questions during the course of the program in the chat box. And at the uh, end, we will try to address as, as many of these as possible. Um, quick announcements. Our chapter recently received a generous donation to support the community outreach program, particularly to focus on communities of color. So the board is excited about what this may offer. And we have a special planning committee uh, led by Gregory Billings, Greg Billings of our board um, to work on this. And if anyone wants to be part of it, please contact Greg Billings. Uh, you can see his email address on the screen. Let me note that this um, slide deck will be made available to participants through the chat box. You can get that link and everything else, all the other links in, 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 in the slides that way. Contributions to DBSA are, of course, welcome both to national uh, through their website uh, or to our chapter, which has, now has a donation link on our website. Both are tax deductible organizations. Here are various links on recent articles and other items of interest, uh, some resources that we in D National DBSA and NIMH have been making available. And here's the list of articles from BP Magazine. We usually send out an updated list each week. So thank you for participating. And as I said, we send out a weekly email, which you can sign up for at the link given here. Previously, we had maintained several email lists. The main email list is, has been retired and people should opt in by clicking on this link. And again, you can get the presentation with the link in chat because otherwise you won't be getting the emails anymore. Uh, all of our meetings currently are on Zoom, but we're identifying them in most cases by the original meeting location. And everyone who has can access us by Zoom by computer or phone can join meetings at their convenience. And the Zoom sign on information is on the website, I think on this slide. Um, so currently we have, I think, seven different support groups of various kinds that includes the new women's group that meets on some Tuesdays, includes the family and loved ones group meeting on some Wednesdays. So we have meetings on Sundays, some Mondays, some Tuesdays, most Wednesdays, not tomorrow, and, e and every Thursday evening. Um, and those, there's a common link for the peer groups and a separate link for the family and friends group. Okay. 
And now I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Kay Redfield Jameson, uh, PhD, but she is, of course, someone who really needs no introduction. I think she is familiar to most of us. She's co-director of the Mood Disorders Center, the Galileo Professor in Mood Disorders, Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at the Johns Hopkins University and Hospital. Uh, let me mention that Dr. Jameson did speak to us once before, I think it was over a decade ago, spoke in person then at the George Washington Hospital Auditorium to which we may return one day. And I think that talk still holds the record for the most largest turnout for, for a talk, but that record may be bested this evening. Um, so Dr. Jameson, and I said, a professor, she's the author of the national bestsellers, An Unquiet Mind, a memoir of moods and madness, an autobiography, also Night Falls Fast, Understanding Suicide, and Touch with Fire, Manic Depressive Illness, and the Artistic Temperament. She's the author of more than 100 scientific papers on mood disorders, creativity, and psychopharmacology. Uh, she was founder of the UCLA Affective Disorders Clinic, co-author of the standard medical textbook on bipolar disorder, the, the authors prefer to call it manic depressive disorder, of which she is one of the foremost authorities. She's also one of its survivors. So she has this dual perspective is both a psychiatric expert and a sufferer from the illness that makes her biography an unquiet mind so affecting and significant. She's received numerous national and international awards, several of which are mentioned. So without further ado, let me uh, turn this over to, to Dr. Jameson. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be talking to DBSA again, one of my favorite groups. You all do such extraordinary work and make such a difference in the lives of so many people. Um, I was fortunate to be uh, at the founding of DBSA, a slightly different incarnation years ago, and have watched just all the incredible things uh, that you all have done. Uh, this evening, I thought I would talk about just briefly, kind of more formally, and then open it up to questions, um, any kind of questions that you, you might have about anything. Uh, I, but I want to talk formally about a topic that uh, I think is interesting for all of us who have gone through uh, the kind of suffering that comes from depression and mania. And that is, what do you do with the suffering once you're better. I mean, how do you learn from adversity? And I want to focus a little bit on a man, uh, a poet, Robert Lowell, whom I uh, was introduced to when I was 17 in high school. And he was someone that my English teacher said, I just had my first breakdown. And my English teacher said, I think you might uh, like uh, Robert Lowell's work. And I, and I did. And I went on to write a biography of him a couple of years ago. But I want to talk about him because he's someone who had a terrible form of bipolar illness and also had a great deal of personal courage and also studied courage. And how, how do you, you know, learn from what you've been through and how do you endure what you've been through? So let me just start by um, uh, talking a little bit about the uses of adversity as I say in a bit more formal sense, and then open it to questions. And much wisdom is much grief, it says in Ecclesiastes. This is a disconcerting thought, yet all of us have a notion of what is meant by the Council of Ecclesiastes. We have all known adversity and suffering. What I would like to do is talk this evening about courage in the face of adversity, how dark times contain within them an essential truth about how we come to know who we are and how adversity can change who we are as individuals. We come to adversity in different ways, through grief, 
depression, bipolar illness, or through the loss of someone we love. Pain and setback are inevitable. Adversity introduces us to our limitations. It can also introduce us to a keener understanding of the human condition. And through that, a greater understanding of what is to heal and what it is to heal and what it is to help others to heal. Clearly, adversity alone does not guarantee great insight. Usually pain is only pain and nothing more. But if suffering is coupled with discipline and imagination and love, the possibility of learning from suffering is more likely. Suffering can fundamentally change our expectations and beliefs about life and human nature. It teaches, as nothing else can teach, about the fragility and the resilience of the human spirit. Many writers and healers have described the impact of their periods of depression, how they struggled with them, and how they use their experience of suffering in their work and in their lives. The influence of Payne's dominion fills novels, canvases, and musical scores. There is no shortage of portrayals. Virginia Woolf, who suffered much of her adult life from attacks of mania and depression, spoke of the lessons from pain. There was a double edge to her depressions, she wrote, but it's always a question of whether I wish to entirely avoid these glooms. These nine weeks give one a plunge into deep waters, which is alarming, but full of interest. There's an edge to it, which I feel is of great importance. One goes down into the well and nothing protects one from the assault of truth. Let me turn briefly to the life and work of Robert Lowell, an American poet whose biography, as I said, I published a few years ago um, and loved every minute of it because I was in the uh, company of not only great artists, but someone whom I he admired immensely as a person. Lowell was a poet of astonishing originality and influence. Twice awarded the Pulitzer Prize for poetry, he, his work left its mark on the century and beyond. Robert Lowell suffered throughout his life from severe mental illness. He was hospitalized more than 20, hospitalized more than 20 times for psychotic manias. Each manic attack was followed by months of depression. Yet from his suffering came extraordinary work. Darkness honestly lived through, he said, is a place of wonder and life. So much has come from there. Lowell's mental illness contributed in a significant way to his art, but discipline and character were absolutely vital. Poetry may come from an unhappy and disordered life, he wrote, but a huge amount of health has to go into the misery. Without question, Lowell's attacks of mania spurred some of his finest work. They also brought great pain to him and to those he loved. Things he had done when he was manic haunted him when he was well. So too did his terror that he would once again become psychotic. Yet time and again, Lowell came back from his madness, re-entered the fray of life, and kept intact his friendships. He kept his wit and his capacity to love. He went back to work. Lowell's faculty for regeneration was highly unusual. So too was the courage to face and write about the certainty that his mania would return, which it did always until he was successfully treated with lithium. For Robert Lowell, contending with mania was a matter of courage. And to understand courage, he looked to the lives and works of others. From childhood, Lowell studied the lives and actions of courageous leaders and artists. He observed and emulated those whose bravery he admired. He was intensely interested in what it meant to overcome fear and adversity. From childhood on, Lowell knew well and lived with violent swings and moods and attacks of dark irrationality. He was used to hard going and he learned from it. Stability and conventional sanity never came easily to him. He did not have the expectation that he would have a straight shot at an untroubled life. He knew from when he was young that art and life were difficult. He knew he would need courage. 
His was a deliberate approach to the study of character and life. In that lay the iron of his mind. In that, in part, lay its restoration after each attack of mania. Courage is usually discussed in the context of nerve on the field of battle or equanimity in facing death. But the courage to live with psychosis and suffering and suicidal depression, and with the knowledge that they will return or may well return, is kin to the bravery shown by warriors on the field. Lowell ran the race set before him, aware always of the dangerous instability of his mind. He kept in the race, uncertain after each return of mania, whether he would write again, love again, teach again, uncertain whether he would regain the edge of sanity he needed to write poetry that would quote, change the game. Robert Lowell was dealt a hand of cards high in privilege and poetic imagination, but he also received dark cards, impossible to play, cards that broke him time and time and time again. There are no rules for how to play such cards. No one has provided a map to navigate psychosis or despair. Lowell played his cards with courage and imagination. He learned, he changed, he learned. Above all, he did not fold. Courage, Churchill's physician said in his classic study of the psychological effects of war, is a moral quality. It is not a chance gift of nature like the aptitude for games. It is cold choice between two alternatives, the fixed resolve not to quit, an act of renunciation which must be made not once but many times by the power of will. Courage is willpower. Some individuals have deeper wells of willpower from which to draw. They have uh, more resources from which to draw, more family and friends from which to draw. Everyone has a limit on how often the well can be tapped. Robert Lowell's character was complicated, but at its core, it was courageous. Few can prevail against mental illness as severe as Lowell's. Still fewer fully re-entered the mix of life as he did time and time again. Insanity is a stress as extreme as being under fire or surviving the brutal cold and extremes of temperature. It demands energy and psychological reserves most people do not have. Most will redraw borders and lower their expectations of life. To those who know the pain of mania or of severe depression, this is a human and natural reaction to assault and suffering. Lowell did not do this. He had a virulent disease, but his determination and disciplined study of character and history, together with his capacity to form and keep friendships, made it possible for him to continue to work and love and to take what he learned from his disease into his art. Quite simply, it allowed him against all odds to write poetry that in the words of a critic will be read as long as men remember English. A disease as any doctor, therapist or priest knows is not just a constellation of symptoms. It is something that occurs to an individual who has strengths and witnesses, weaknesses and character and circumstances. These in turn determine how the disease is perceived, fought and managed. Understanding this, that one learns from the strong and extends compassion to those less so, is at the heart of learning how to heal and heal others. Compassion for human limitations is essential for those people who would heal and for family members and friends. It is not easy to be compassionate toward a deeply disturbed or difficult person, and it's disingenuous to say otherwise. Yet it is not possible to be a good psychotherapist, friend, or family member without accepting the darker, weaker side of human nature. We're dealt the cards, we're dealt. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jamison. That was very, very helpful. Um, I'm going to get to some questions first, but I'm going to be the uh, take take the uh, advantage of saying uh, uh, asking the first question, which is in this time of COVID, uh, where we see a lot of adversity. 
Do you have any thoughts on, on how uh, we can uh, address mood disorders or have you seen any observations about how people are, are having uh, responses to mood disorders in, in this time of COVID? Well, it's, I think it's really hard and, and it's so different mm -hmm. across people. I mean, again, mm -hmm. uh, life is so unfair in terms of who has the resources to survive well in a situation like COVID and those who do not. I, th I think that always reaching out to people uh, is important, uh, easier said than done when you can't really see people until recently. Um, but I think, again, I think reading um, about the lives of other people uh, who are going through similar straits, um, telemedicine, one of the things that's been striking at uh, Johns Hopkins is how effective uh, and how much patients like telemedicine and how much therapists like it. Um, I think that all of us thought that there would be a, a really keen resistance to seeing people, talking to people over the phone or, mm -hmm. or Zoom. But in fact, it's turned out to be pretty effective and people don't have to spend the time coming in and, and so forth. So I think one of the things that comes out of any kind of disaster is, is some kinds of innovation. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and then several people have asked questions about a recording of this and whether it's gonna be available and yes, so beyond the DBSA National Capital uh, Area, uh, website, probably about a week for us to get it up. So uh, first I have a question from Andre. He says, how to influence trust for parents of a child, adult child with bipolar one and OCD on meds, lots of insight of rapid cycles and can become obsessed um, in an unquiet, as described in an unquiet mind. Um, not sure I fully read his question well, but. Yeah. What was the, which part of the question? Yeah. Um, let me actually, uh, let me see if I find Andre in the, uh, uh, here and see if I can unmute him and maybe he can ask the question. Um, um, so Andre's still here. Um, yeah, let me see. Um, let me see if we can come back to that question. He says, how to influence trust uh, for a parent um, uh, of an adult bipolar, child with bipolar one on meds with lots of rapid cycling can become obsessed with dangerous love interest. Yeah. But, well, maybe, maybe he can restate that question in the box. Uh, I think uh, that one, uh, one thing that uh, comes to mind is of all groups, DBSA has family support mm -hmm. and possibilities of, of learning about it because I think one of the most useful things obviously for any family member is to actually learn about the symptoms and the treatment and how it shows itself and what might be done about it. And, and DBSA has not only that, that mm -hmm. kind of teaching about the illness, but also supports for families. Okay. Yeah. Kevin has asked the question, how can I advocate to rise, uh, raise SSDI payments for everyone and increase parity in Medicare so that there are more providers in mental health uh, will accept that the current system does not facilitate independence and forces dependence on someone else for financial survival? Um, it's a great question. I think that one of the things that's always striking to anybody who has mental illness or advocates for people with mental illness is that it's, it's sort of the last question that comes to mind is what are the financial and insurance and treatment um, fairnesses and they're not fair and, and they're outrageous. I think ultimately it's a political question and we have an administration now that is asking those kinds of questions that is very dedicated, I think, to addressing it. Yes, I would agree with that as, as a part of the advocacy team at the National DBSA. Um, we do see that this is an issue that's of great concern and, and we're working on, uh, we're actually working on some uh, legislation right now to uh, expand the use of peer support specialists in Medicare. So we're, we're, we're trying. Um, Trisha has asked, how do we uh, cope with the remote working long-term and lack of connection with people? Um, I feel uh, like I'm getting agoraphobia too. Um, you know, again, I think one thing is that things are beginning to change. You know, I think if, if, you, if we had to look out at another year of this where you couldn't go out, you couldn't see people, you couldn't see family, friends, colleagues, um, that would be one thing. But it, it does seem like we're beginning to 
round the corner on this, you know, and if, if the vac vaccinations uh, get distributed fairly and, and widely. Um, but, you know, there's no question about it. There's been yeah. an awful time for people in terms of people who most need support and love and caring are isolated. Uh, Lauren has asked, how would Dr. Jameson advise on resisting the temptation of media? Uh, <laughs> good question. How do you resist mania? I tell you, at least in my own case, I, I just got manic one too many times and it was so disastrous and it, related, uh, it resulted in a highly suicidal depression for about 18 months that I, I haven't been tempted since. Um, I think that one of the things that is, is clear and it's it particularly very early on in the illness is that it, and I often tell the residents this, is that it's, it's almost like having dual diagnosis, that you're addicted almost to a substance in your own head, uh, euphoria, um, high energy, high voltage state, <clears throat> and it's, it's very difficult. Um, but I think that's a place where psychotherapy can make a real difference. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carol has asked, how common is it with bipolar 2 to be in hypomanic state for two months? What medication would you recommend? I realize you may not be able to recommend medication. But... Um, the, the question was bipolar illness, uh, hypomania for two months or? Yeah, yeah. How common is it with bipolar two to be in a hypomanic state for two months? Um, it's uh -huh. not uncommon. I mean, I think what, what you can say about bipolar two is pretty much what you can say about bipolar one, which is you see every variation possible. So some people have only very short hypomanias, like a few days. Others go on for long periods of time. Um, those tend to be very disruptive to not only the person involved, but to the lives of other people. But in terms of treatment, I mean, that's, that again, there are, you know, I think treatments that are out there now and a, a question of, uh, I think, getting a good consultation. Second yeah. Okay. Um, Elizabeth has said, uh, asked, how do you suggest dealing with the heavy sedation of medication? I need at least 12 hours a night and people just tell me to stay on a sleep schedule. Um, it's hard. I think that one of the things that happens over time is that uh, the brain begins to accommodate to some extent to some of the side effects, the sedating side effects. Um, also, over time, people, if, if you get more stable and your moods get more stable, uh, people can lower uh, level. So, if, for example, when I was first working, people were kept at very high levels, and I was, you know, just zonked, um, found it very hard to read, concentrate, uh, slept a lot. Um, but people are kept on lower levels now, so I think it's a question of trying to work with the person who's prescribing medications to bring it down as much as possible, but to make sure you don't bring it in. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan has asked a question. He says, for those of us on lithium uh, for decades, 30 years of 30 milligrams to 600 milligrams, where has it been very effective and how concerned should I be about how it affects our kidneys or what we can do to be protective of it? Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things, one of the advantages of lithium is it's been around for 60 years. So we have a huge amount of information about the side effects and complications, adverse reactions and so forth. Uh, there are, there can be kidney effects. Uh, it turns out that doesn't, uh, anything that's consequential doesn't happen very often. Um, and if people are monitored carefully, um, that tends to be very much minimized. I mean, lithium is a really good drug. I mean, it's got its problems like all drugs do, but it's it, if somebody is responding well to lithium, you want to, you know, uh, keep that. Okay. Um, Thomas has asked, I'm going through TMS for depression and anxiety. What is your opinion on TMS? Uh, I think TMS is really, really promising. I mean, there's been a lot of work on it and uh, for a lot of different conditions. And I think that not just TMS, but other kinds of um, more uh, well serious uh, deep brain stimulation and so forth that, you know, like ECT, that that's been around, the idea has been around for since the 1930s. 
um, and TMS recently, you know, it, when it works, it has the advantage of having fewer adverse effects. And um, when it works, it works really well. Thank you. Um, Sarah has asked, I'm trying to find a career field that I can do with my bipolar type two and anxiety. I've tried teaching college students, working as a paralegal at a law firm and many other fields. What would you advise in terms of finding a good fit and disclosure to my place of employment? Um, I think sometimes it just takes a long time to figure out what it is you feel comfortable doing, uh, what you what you like. I mean, I like academics because basically you've got a huge amount of freedom. Um, mm -hmm. You just kind of run and, and do strange things for the most part, and people mm -hmm. don't give you a lot of flack. Um, not everybody wants to do that or can do that. I think it takes people a lot of time to figure out what they want to do. And that's, that's, and that's true for most people in life. It's not just people mm -hmm. with, with mood disorders. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill has asked, what lies ahead for mood disorders as the understanding of the brain advances through the result of ever-changing scanning methods? Um, I think most people who study mood disorders would be really optimistic about what we're learning in terms of genetics and imaging um, and neurobiology. I mean, it's a, it's a field where it's just going really rapidly and there are a lot of really smart scientists who are looking at these things. So I, I think, you know, from the very practical in terms of developing um, more specific medications and medications that don't cause such side effects to understanding how the brain works what moods are all about and so forth. I, I think that it's, you know, it's, it's a great time to be alive. Thank you. Uh, here's a question. I suffer from PTSD, depression, isolation, loneliness, suicide ideation, aging solo, and I'm currently feeling bouts of anxiety as I see this pandemic as a severe bout of mania because it will never end. It has two questions. One, how do we find a balance with our mental illness without denying that we've ever had uh, an illness, which I have had some suggest suffering um, with PTSD as they say they've been cured. Two, what is the new normal with the COVID-19 for someone who suffers from a, a mental illness looks like when without denying the various moods? Um, yeah, you know, I think the, the new, we don't know what the new norm, normal is. I mean, uh, for example, I was listening to Graham Rao's presentation on Monday uh, at Hopkins and one of the things that's very interesting is that people predicted that the suicide rate would go up uh, very much uh, during the COVID epidemic, pandemic. And it hasn't. It, what has been very disturbing is that the suicide rate in African Americans has skyrocketed. And that's something mm -hmm. that is, you know, really of a lot of concern for a lot of reasons. But the overall suicide rate has not gone up. If anything, it's gone down a bit. So I think we don't really know um, the jury's out on what, what all this has done. Um, it, I don't think it can do anybody any good to have a solitude when you need help and company. Um, on the other hand, some people have been benefited from solitude. Uh, Abby has asked, a loved one is not yet formally diagnosed with bipolar, but several healthcare professionals have identified it. He attributes his mood swings to circumstances during COVID, including increased marijuana use, which he believes induced mania. I know data is increasing in this field. Is there marijuana induced mania or depression? And if so, this change, if so, would this change whether medications are needed to treat? Uh, I, there's no question that marijuana is bad for uh, the brain of people who are inclined to mood disorders, you know, it's just, it's like setting fire and particularly marijuana in this day and age, because it's of, of a much higher uh, concentration mm -hmm. and it's not as not regulated um, in the way that you would like it to be. So uh, marijuana is not a benign drug when it comes to mania and depression. Um, Erica writes, I read, read and hear about those who survived depression or when I was depressed, which is confusing to me. I don't know what it feels like to not want to die, always present fatigue unless I'm hypomanic. Um, I, have, oh, I have felt like this at least since I was three. 
ECT, every medication, every therapy has not made me even closer survivor. Um, do you hear about people who have always been profoundly depressed? Um, it, it certainly happens. I would say it's pretty unusual. I mean, uh, bipolar illness and depression, you know, first occur usually in adolescence, early 20s. Um, it's relatively unusual to have a, a just completely chronic course of it. Uh, again, it's a place where um, getting a second opinion uh, from a specialist is, is a good idea. And I say that recognizing that a lot of people can't afford a first opinion, much less a second opinion. But if it's possible, mm -hmm. a second opinion, um, great. Um, let's see, Caroline uh, says, going back to when you said about what you said about being tempted into mania, is mania ever fully avoidable or is it out of your control? Can you tell when a manic episode is approaching? A um, couple things. First of all, it is um, largely avoidable through modern medications. I mean, um, not always entirely. Some people get treated with say lithium and don't get manic again. Other people need more medications, different combination of medications. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's complicated illness from that point of view, but I, I think many people get really well, you know, I think that's important to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, Kia asks, hi, Dr. Jamison, loved your book on Quiet Mind. Thank you for sharing your life struggle with us. Very honored to hear you speak this evening. Um, I'm confused by the diagnosis of bipolar one and two. Um, I was first diagnosed with schizoaffective bipolar and suffer from depression more. Can you explain the difference between bipolar one and two? Good question. Yes, um, bipolar one is where you have a history of uh, full-blown mania, uh, so it's the, extra, it's the severity of the mania and depression, whereas with hypomania or bipolar two, it's a less severe form of, of mania. It doesn't mean that it isn't a very disruptive and painful form of mania because people do things when they're hypomanic and because they are enjoying it and their judgment is impaired, they don't always recognize all, all, all the difficulties that they are, are lining up for themselves. But we know that the genetics of bipolar 2 are, are, tend to run in families a bit more. Um, so there's some, some separation there. Uh, but it's, it, these are, at some level, I think the jury is out. Uh, it's what science is all about. And so maybe in 10 years, we may have no disease that we do now. But at the moment, bipolar one, bipolar two is really based on, on the severity. And generally with bipolar two, you hear episodes of depression. Thank you. Uh, Anne has asked, does borderline personality disorder share common symptoms as bipolar one disorder? Does lithium work? For BBD, what is the best alternative to lithium? Right. Um, bipolar, uh, borderline personality disorder um, does not have the genetic component. I mean, we know with bipolar one that it's highly genetic. So the family history is very important. Um, there are certainly overlapping symptoms of impulsiveness, volatility of mood, um, anger, those kinds of kind of dysregulation of mood, but they're they're quite different disorders um, when it comes comes down to it. Um, someone's asked, how far are we from biomarkers for diagnosis of bipolar disorder? I think not far. Um, you know, I think that people are developing them as we speak. Um, as I say, I think what what's really heartening is the level of really great science uh, and bright-eyed, bushy-tailed scientists going after these issues. I mean, there's, you know, if you look 20 years ago, you wouldn't have had the concentration of really great scientists uh, going after the science of depression and mania. And we have that now. And another question about the treatment 
the format, the transcranial direct current stimulation um, and how effective that is for treatment of bipolar two. Um, again, I think that the jury is still a lot of, a bit on the TMSs and, and treatments but they're promising and they work in a lot of people. Uh, it's just that uh, it's not as well studied as medications have been studied, but it uh, doesn't mean that they can't be very effective. I've had it's just had a similar question about spec scans. Uh, not, I've never heard of spec scan. What would you use one for? Um, S-P-E-C-T. Right, I'm, I'm not sure that people would use it for a whole lot. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not one of the more um, well-validated. Okay, uh, question in, I, uh, I really appreciate the reading and made me less alone in my disease, currently in a depressive mood and feel completely paralyzed and can't seem to make art. I'm doing the things, the psychotherapy, reaching out, staying sober, sleeping eight hours, exercises. But when I'm in this state, I feel like I'll never get out of it or make it again. I also feel like I can't differentiate between anxiety and depression. How can one really understand which is which? And how do you combat that being stuck? Okay. Um, it can be very hard. Uh, you know, there's, an, there's a large comorbidity between anxiety and and mood disorders and people, anxiety is a common component of a lot of depressions. So again, I think it's a place where, you know, you wanna read, you wanna question your doctor, um, the person who's prescribing, um, just go in and ask a lot of questions. Um, Martin has asked, I feel very disappointed with my treatment with a world expert. I was on lithium for seven years and now I have stage three renal disease. Because I could not use lithium, I was put on Abilify, and two years later, I started with tardive dyskinesia. Now I am taking niopidine, as recommended by Dr. Post, having trouble accepting these bad side effects. Any suggestions for hope? Um, no, is that Bob Post? I think he's referred to Bob Post, yes. Uh, he's a really good doctor. Um, I don't know. I would just, again, I think that to the extent that you can um, go in with just a long list of questions, very detailed questions and start asking um, Dr. Post if anybody can, can uh, answer mm -hmm. questions. Um, this is a, a question, I'm not sure how, how, how to respond to it, for you to respond to it. It says, uh, the National Capital Area has Dr. James in the neighborhood, yet when it came to finding good programs for our son who has bipolar one, we were directed to the Boston area. I would love to hear Dr. Jameson's views on high quality structured programs, such as residential programs, PHPs, IOPs in the national capital region and neighborhood. I assume that includes Baltimore. Um, you know, I, I think that that's exactly what you all do well. You know the programs. Uh, you're probably much, much more familiar with the individual programs than I am. Um, so I would start with asking DBSA. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question from Pamela is one actually I was thinking about. Uh, it's asking about how we end the stigma of mental illness. I know that you just did a program with uh, Richard Grinker on his new book, uh, Nobody's Normal. And I'll just put a little sales plug in here right now. We've got uh, Dr. Grinker lined up in May for our speakers program also. Uh, but do you want to talk a little bit about stigma and, and, and uh, how we can address that? Um, I have a bit of a problem with the word stigma because I think it stigmatizes. And mm -hmm. I think that as soon as you say something is stigmatized, there's an assumption that there's something to stigmatize. It's, it's hard to, to uh, be more articulate about it. I think that my, I'm personally much more com comfortable with the concept of discrimination because it has a legal quality and a civil rights quality to it. I think that what are, is most concerning is really what are the discriminations against people who have mental illness in terms of employment, in terms of um, treatment uh, costs, in terms of a, a number of things. I don't know how, there's not been a lot of success in changing people's attitudes. It's, 
it sounds good and it sounds important and it is, you know, you want to reach out to people and change attitudes. I think education can do that to a point. I think treatment, if you look at the history of medicine, um, treatment is probably the thing that destigmatizes more than anything. So if you look at epilepsy, uh, when it was so stigmatized because people couldn't control um, seizures, that as soon as there were medications available to control seizures, a lot of the stigma went down. Uh, likewise, with, likewise with cancer and likewise with um, AIDS, where when AIDS was seen as inevitably lethal diagnosis, a, a deadly diagnosis, it was far more stigmatized than now when people have treatments and you know they're, they're going on with their lives and so forth. So I think treatments, effective treatments, and I think one of the things that's been great about um, psychiatric illnesses is that there's been um, the improvement in treatment has had an effect on stigma. I mean, if you look at you know around the medical school where there used to be a lot of skepticism, deep skepticism about departments of psychiatry because they were doing all these kind of absurd things. And, and now um, people in the Department of Medicine and uh, so forth have much, much more respect because they've seen what antidepressant medications can do, for example. Um, uh, Lauren has asked, how does one decide on whether to disclose a bipolar diagnosis to colleagues, especially in the mental health field? Um, I think it's really hard, and I think you want to be really circumspect. Uh, there's no doubt that it can be uh, liberating and that it can help other people as well as yourself. There's also no question, I, I get asked that quite a bit by the residents and medical students at Hopkins. You know, you don't know how people are going to respond, and you don't have any guarantee that people aren't going to hold it against you. So it's not that you don't do it. I, I think you just want to be very, very careful, talk about it with people you respect and love and who are concerned for your well being uh, before you do it. Uh, Lizzie is asking uh, I struggle with hopelessness related to having an illness that doesn't go away and that is so difficult to treat. I've had many doctors and therapists over the years say, I'm just not quite sure what to do anymore. I shrug my shoulders. <laughs> I keep pushing forward, uh, but it is very hard. Any words of wisdom? Um, no, I, I don't. I, 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 th I think that it's a, a matter often of, of just finding and persevering. It's, and again, it's not always easy to persevere. Um, and it's not always easy financially to keep persevering. Um, but reading a lot uh, about your illness can lead to sometimes better questions. Um, and support groups, again, I think support groups are terrific in terms of uh, being with people and talking with people who are going through similar kinds of, uh, as you say, hopelessness. Um, Thanks. Uh, Nick has asked what your thoughts are on the inheritability of bipolar and having kids. He says, I am bipolar type one and in the pro kid camp. What's your experience with this? Um, I think, uh, first of all, it, it is clearly very heritable. It's also treatable. Um, and I think that people you know, you have to make decisions on the basis of what your circumstances are and, and whether you feel like you're up to having kids. And that's not, not just for people with bipolar illness, but people in general, I think, have to make those decisions. But there's absolutely nothing that um, keeps people from who have bipolar illness from having children. Uh, Laura has written, thank you for presenting tonight and share your experiences and knowledge in your books. I read several of them and appreciated your sharing your story. Um, Sarah asked, what does the tuna work for bipolar type two? Or how, I'm sorry, how does the tuna work for bipolar type two? Um, it's really complicated. It's sort of like, um, actually I think it's Dr. Post who has a, a, a famous slide that says, how does lithium work? And mm -hmm. it's hopelessly complicated with arrows going every which way and so forth. So it would be hard to mm -hmm. I think address that. Um, sure. but, and you know, I think if you, a, a, a great thing about the 
uh, Googling things is that the, there's a lot of information about Latuda out there on, on the internet. And some of it's crazy and some of it <laughs> very bad. Uh, Bill is asking, how does one distinguish a very creative artist, poet, novels, et cetera, from a very creative artist with mania? Is there a medical evaluation that can be done around that? Or? Um, I, I think, you know, people either have mania or they don't have mania. Um, and for, for some artists, there is a period of time as people escalate, begin to escalate into mania where they get very creative or feel that they're creative. So for example, Robert Lowell, when he would get, begin to get manic, would also begin to generate lots of ideas and lots of uh, pages full of uh, verse and so forth. And then he would get absolutely manic, which was useless and, and destructive to his work. And then found that when he was depressed, he very often sort of uh, whipped the, the poetry into shape because he got obsessive and he, he could concentrate on what he was doing. Um, let's see, uh, Caroline says, uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. It's an honor for you to be here. My question is how can I best support loved ones with bipolar one or two during a quarantine? Um, how would you describe one's episodes in just a few words? Um, I, I, th I think that, you know, reaching out to people and sometimes, sometimes by phone, sometimes by Zoom, but sometimes just by sending emails and saying, look, I'm mm -hmm. here, I'm available, I care about you, what can I do to be of help? And sometimes it actually has the benefit of not forcing yourself into an, a, uh, it, it, entwined relationship that's going to get fraught or angry, paranoid or whatever. So I think sometimes just keeping in, in touch and... Um, mm -hmm. Yes, that's certainly, and this, the issues of social isolation and loneliness have certainly been very key for us last yeah. year. Um, Abby says, I understand that for a number of reasons, tracking moods and symptoms is important for people with bipolar disorder what role do family, friends, caregivers play in tracking signs and symptoms? How can we best help? Uh, well, I think the two things. One is the kind of tracking of moods that individuals who have mania and depression can do. And there are a lot of tools you now for doing it, you know, um, on your um, iPhone or, or whatever. Uh, the other is that one of the really important things I think that's come out of the last 10 or 15 years is, is teaching family members um, to be aware of the early stages of mania. Um, so that people, for any individual, that somebody might start moving furniture around, somebody might start spending more money, somebody might start spending staying up later. So become aware of those early symptoms before they escalate. Because after a certain point, if they escalate too far, you know, you've lost that person really to, to mania and, and it's too, too far away. Um, I think too, that one of the things that can be very helpful is to sit down as a family or friends with the clinician and say, what can I do that's of help? You know, what did I do when you were sick that drove you crazy and was completely not helpful, was nerve wracking. And what did I do that was really of, of use to you. And I think doctors should be responsive to that as well. I mean, I always ask patients, you know, what do I do? What's been helpful? What's not been helpful? And I think doing that with family members, because sometimes people just want to be left alone when they're depressed, but they want to feel safe. So they want somebody in the house, but they don't want to have to interact with them. So, you know, it, it, there are all these things that you can talk about and, and, and get a beat on. Do you have experience with clients who have manic episodes triggered by certain foods? It's triggered by certain, certain, certain types of food? Uh, not so much. I mean, unless mm. you consider marijuana food. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, someone has asked, my sister is taking Invega Sustanena shot after a manic episode last year, but now she is in a depressive state for six months. My sister is getting to the point that she's refusing the shot because she's so depressed. What do you think about that? 
Um, I think she should pay attention to what she feels is not working and it, or is making her worse. And again, when in doubt, just go in with questions and say, mm -hmm. I have this concern, I have that concern. Um, and, you know, because you have a right to expect thorough answers from the person who's prescribing. Thank you. Um, Kathy's asked, I think, a really good question that's hard to uh, for a lot of us to to to, uh, to think about. Was is what can be done to help someone with a mood di <coughs> mood disorder if they don't seem to want to pursue treatment? Uh, a, as everyone will know, the most difficult uh, part of of treating, uh, particularly bipolar illness, but also depression. And I think that you know. It, Sometimes doing an intervention like you would with alcohol or, or drugs where you get a group of people who are concerned and say, look, this, we're concerned. Uh, we've lined up an appointment with whomever and uh, we really need for you to see and, and be very specific about what it is that you're concerned about. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, it's 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 the hardest thing in treating uh, mood disorders is getting people to acknowledge that they have an illness. It's, it's very, very hard. Um, Maria has asked, how common do you think it is that clients with PTSD or acute stress disorder, constant flashback mode, are mixed up, misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder? Um, I think it happens. I think that uh, by and large, they're pretty different um, di diagnoses. Uh, there's not to say that you can't have an overlap, uh, obviously. Uh, a lot of people who have bipolar illness also suffer from PTSD, but um, I think the same way that you would make a diagnosis otherwise, you know, what's the family history? What's the cyclicity? What's the nature of the symptoms? You know. Um, Mm -hmm. um, sounds like your clock. Um, do you have any suggestions or reading uh, uh, materials on how to distinguish between bipolar type one symptoms and personality traits of being an adult child of alcohol? No. Um, Frank Mondemore, um, who was at Hopkins, he's retired now, but wrote a book about bipolar disorder and he you know, he addresses all those kind of related issues as well. I, I've forgotten what the title is, but it's Frank M O N D I M O R E, and it's I think it's just called bipolar disorder. But. Okay, two last questions, and we're going to wrap up here. Uh, uh, first, from Martin, how do you decide if your doctor is offering the best or right treatment? Some doctors just do not seem well informed. Um, I, I think that's a huge issue. Um, I think that, you know, we all like to think that everyone you see is wildly competent, but it's just not true. Um, people have various levels of caring, but much more importantly, they have various levels of uh, competence. And I think that it's important always, again, if, you, if you're not getting well in the way in which you think you should get well, is to badger, badger, badger. I mean, I, I think no good doctor should be threatened by repeated questioning uh, about why he or she is doing something. Um, and if they are, then, you know, that tells you all you need to know. Thank you. The last question is from Jane says, when do you think brain scientists will be able to provide people with unipolar or bipolar disorder custom medications without this trial method error? That's the easiest question of the night, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know- Great you know, question though, great question. Yeah. I think that's kind of what, if you talk to clinical scientists, what they would love to avoid is this kind of empirical notion of, of how you treat depression, for example. You give somebody an antidepressant, it doesn't work. If you give them another antidepressant, it doesn't work. Then maybe by the fourth or fifth antidepressant, what you'd like to be able to do is just start uh, with the one, just be able to draw blood or something and figure out which one you should start with. And people are already beginning to study the genetics and response to lithium, 
because we know that a lot of people respond really, really well to, to lithium, but some people will never respond, don't respond. So you'd like to spare everybody that highly demoralizing phase of having to go through this. So I think that, I mean, this is a high priority for everyone. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Alvin, uh, but I want to say there's a number of thank yous in the chat box for you. We all appreciate your being here. Um, and I can say with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Alvin uh, to wrap us up for the night. Okay. Um, there's little for me yet to say. I note again that there are a whole bunch of thank yous in the chat box. Thank you for doing this program, for putting it on. And so I reflect those over to Dr. Jameson. I also want to thank Eric for his role as host and his handling the questions. And that seems like a, there are lots of questions. We apologize so we didn't get all, but I really appreciate Eric go, going through them. I'm not sure I would have felt very, very capable. Uh, so, uh, and Eric has given us a preview of the coming program in May Dr. Grinker, um, you know, we have our support groups ongoing. We have various activities. It's an exciting time for our chapter. We've got this big grant and we want to figure out how we might best do outreach. Um, we, of course, welcome every chance we get to get one of the stars of such as Dr. Jameson. And so we're very appreciative. Hope we'll they have another occasion and Otherwise, what is there for me to say, but stay well, get vaccinated, um, and please please join us in our coming coming activities. And thank so, you for inviting me. It's, still, it's wonderful to be back. Maybe I'll be back at the Georgetown uh, Auditorium in person. That would be nice. Yeah, uh, we've been having the GW, and uh, I presume that time is coming. It's not here yet, but... Well, let me know. We will, though, continue to have some of our groups going on via Zoom, even as as our other established groups will have the chance to move back to their their locations. And eventually, we'll have programs on campus at GW. Maybe we can combine that with with a virtual option. So, we'd love to have you back, and we'll look forward to seeing seeing what might be best to arrange. Okay. Thank you again. Dr. Jameson, thank you all, and good night. Good night.